Okay. Um, I'm going to try the regular modem now. See if it works. Santana. And we're back again, okay. Um, and uh, I founded that with a couple of friends and we've been going ever since. We were actually founded it in America and then a couple of years ago we decided to move it to Europe for various reasons, because I'm not living in America anymore. Um, I'm based in Colombia with my wife at the Animal Sanctuary. It's the only animal sanctuary in Colombia. Colombia, of course, is at the northern part of uh, South America and it's not a dangerous place like that is portrayed in Hollywood. It's actually quite peaceful here and very beautiful, you know, food, like tropical fruits all year round. It's amazing. So every day I have like, you know, a real super smoothie with, uh, you know, organic mangoes, organic uh, bananas, dragon fruit, papaya, aloe vera, turmeric, um, ginger, cacao, Moringa, spinach, <laughs> all sorts of good stuff. And, uh, you know, that powers me for the whole morning. Um, so Food for Life Global has been going, you know, in its official form as the headquarters since 1995. So we're like 20, 21 years old. And it's made up of 210 projects across 60 countries. Um, that doesn't include all of them. There's a quite a lot of micro projects, which we're not including because they're hard to quantify, but there's a lot of people that have approached me. And this is something that all you guys may be interested in, in starting your own food for life program. Cause I actually wrote a book, how to start, how to build a, you know, a vegan food relief. I have a little book. So I think it's a 90 page booklet. So you can start your own program and become affiliated with food for life global. So we have quite a lot of projects all over the world. Um, and they vary in size and scope. We have very sophisticated programs in India where we have these re really high tech kitchens. If you check out my YouTube channel, you'll see a documentary I created called Uniting the World Through Pure Food, which gives a, you know, uh, explains the philosophy of food for life and it gives them ex uh, some footage, it shows some footage of, of our projects in India, which are really amazing, you know, very efficient where we feed just in India alone about 1.3 meals, 1.3 million meals a day. It's pretty amazing, every single day. And they're freshly prepared meals. They're not packaged. It's like fresh vegetables cut, dal and rice and chapatis and whatever. We actually have a chapati making machine in some of the kitchens, depending on what part of India, because in the northern part of India, people prefer chapatis more than rice. So we have a chapati making machine and this chapati making machine, you know what chapatis are, right? They're the, the Indian flatbread. So it makes like 10,000 chapatis an hour. <laughs> so you put dough in one end, uh, in the, sorry, you put like flour and dough and everything and it mixes it up and pumps out 10,000 chapatis in one hour. It's incredible. So it's very high tech. We have steam cookers so we can cook like 700 liters of rice in 15 minutes. And that's the only way we could we could possibly you know, reach numbers that we need to reach. Uh, you know, just in one kitchen alone, I'll do like fifty to sixty meals in one kitchen. There's one kitchen which is pretty amazing. It's one of the most efficient kitchens. It's actually based in Mumbai, and it's just it visualize this. It's twelve hundred square feet. I actually talk about this on the documentary. It's twelve hundred square feet. So it's divided up into quarters. So 300 square feet is for actually cutting the vegetables and washing the rice and dals. 300 square feet is for storage. 300 square feet is for actually cleaning the dishes, cleaning the you know pots and pans and contain stainless steel containers which we use to deliver the meals to the schools. 
and only 300 square feet is used to cook the meals. And in that kitchen, they do 65,000 meals a day in 300 square feet. <laughs> it's unheard of in the West. India is the home of, you know, large scale cooking. I don't know if you've ever seen the mega kitchens uh, documentaries on National Geo, I think it is. So we're, we're actually highlighted on one of those, one of those shows. So um, the project is unique in that it has um, not only a very efficient way of feeding people, um, very healthy vegan meals, but it's also the philosophy, the, the message which we want to convey through that loving action, which is when we give someone food unconditionally with love, we're basically communicating to them that you are my brother, you are my sister, I care about you. So we believe that the root cause of world hunger, and in fact, every problem in the world today is inequality, but not physical inequality, spiritual inequality, because physically we're all different. We can never be equal physically. We're just different, different circumstances, different body types. But spiritually, we are equal because we're essentially we're coming from the same energetic source. So even if you're a big bang proponent, so you're, you know, you're, you believe in the big bang and you don't believe you're an atheist. Even if you're a big bang proponent, still, you have to admit that we're coming from the same energy. So we all have an energetic root, which is similar to all of us. And that includes all species. So what we want to do through this program, and as you see, the actual main message we convey on the website is uniting the world through pure food. So food has that power to unite. It is a great, great communicator. And that's, that's true even for food that is not necessarily pure, just like Thanksgiving yesterday. And so many people killed turkeys and ate all these horrible things. But even that food, has a certain power, potency, to bring people together, to unite families, to make them feel like connected. That's the power of food. What to speak of pure food, really pure food, that's prepared with love, that's free from violence, that's to serve with love. You know, that food has way more power. So that's what we're teaching in food yoga, and that's what we want to convey to people when we do food distribution with Food for Life Global. Food Yoga is a division of Food for Life Global. It's a book, it's based on a book I wrote um, a couple of years ago. Um, and essentially this book is teaching people how to nourish their mind, body and soul. Because most of the health gurus today, uh, even the vegan chefs and so on, um, most of them are talking about the, the nutrients, you know, the, the, the physical benefits of a vegan diet. But very few are talking about the psychological, the spiritual benefits of a vegan diet. And so that's where food yoga comes in. We're trying to teach people that the type of food you, you eat will have a dramatic impact on your consciousness. And the main takeaway from the food yoga book is um, this one point is that spiritual life or evolution of consciousness begins when you master the tongue, when you learn to master your tongue. And I learned this as a yogi when I was a monk. And the tongue has two functions, tasting and vibrating. So what you speak and what you eat, what you put in your mouth, will have a dramatic impact on your consciousness. So um, food yoga, therefore, is a lifestyle where you actually nourish your mind, body and soul. And food becomes not simply a mundane act of just filling the belly, but it becomes a spiritual experience where you're actually nourishing your soul. You're actually becoming more and more enlightened, more aware by your food choices and by having a very conscious and loving relationship with your food, having respect and gratitude. For example, when you pick the spinach, you know, you ask permission. You understand that that spinach has life. There's, there's a soul present within that spinach. There's life there. It's not simply a bunch of chemicals. There's a living force there. So you ask permission, can I please, you know, take one of, you know, a few of your leaves and you have gratitude and um, understanding that these plants, fruits and plants are actually making the greatest sacrifice. They, they're sacrificing their body for our nourishment. 
it's the greatest sacrifice. So a food yogi is someone that's very conscious of that and has gratitude and is, you know, prepares food with that, with that sort of attitude. So uh, if anyone has any questions, I can answer some of the questions. Um, if anyone wants to be a guest, we can also talk. Yes, emotional benefits, of course. Asking me permission is a Wiccan thing. Yeah, well, asking permission is, yeah, it's a Wiccan thing, but it's not exclusively Wiccan. But yeah, I, I, I have seen that too. They, they, because they're very conscious of nature. So, and that's one of the things I teach in food yoga, that the, the beginning step of becoming a food yoga is to become conscious of nature, mother nature. That's like stage one. Um, and in fact, it's even described in the ancient scriptures of India that the first steps in self-realization, the first steps, is when you see God in nature, when you see the divine in nature, and you don't you don't you don't see separateness. You see the, the, the presence of of divinity everywhere. So Wiccans, of course, are, understand that. That's a very very important part of their whole life lifestyle. Yeah. So if you're a Wiccan, then you would definitely dig for yoga. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, any questions here? Um, mm -hmm. But not all believe in higher power somewhere. Yeah, I understand, Alicia. Um, I understand that. But the point is, even if you don't believe in a divine intelligence, divine creator, um, which logically makes sense to me, um, because of the nature of the world, the, the, this, the complexity of the world around us. It's just, it's impossible in my mind that it could just be random, just a random sort of combination of, you know, energies. There's definitely a designer, an architect. Anyway, so even if you don't, still you have to understand the energetic uh, interdependence, energetic connection that we all have with each other. So even if you just get to that can still um, you know really benefit your mind body and consciousness so Anita says the day after I was diagnosed with lupus I felt an amazing change towards nature it was a good thing well, that's good I'm just looking for all yeah it just makes sense to me um, I mean you look at for example if you take the time to study nature, like just a simple flower, it's amazing. Or like, for example, a mosquito. Like my teacher one time was, um, he was really good teaching through his, his actions. And he, one time he was looking at a mosquito on his desk. And his, disciple, his, his student was wondering, what is he doing? He's just like studying the mosquito. Right? And he said, he said to his student, he says, look, there's a pilot inside. <laughs> there's a pilot inside that little thing, that little body. There's a pilot, right? It's not simply a, a bunch of chemicals. So there's a consciousness, there's a soul present in all living things. Wherever there's, you see, consciousness is a symptom of the soul, a symptom of divinity. Uh, it, it cannot be manufactured. It's not a product of the brain. It's, and even today, many quantum physicists and science, they're all starting to be open to this, uh, that, you know, the consciousness is definitely transcendental. It's not, it's not something that can be manufactured. It's not something that is a byproduct of the brain, but it's something that is transcendental to this mundane energy. In the Bhagavad Gita, the ancient scriptures of India, which studied as a monk, is described as essentially eight energies Earth, water, fire, air, and ether are the five gross energies. And the, the three subtle energies, mind, intelligence, and false ego. So everything that we experience in this world is a combination of those eight energies. Of course, those energies express themselves in different ways, and I explain this in the book Food Yoga. For example, fire. When we think of the fire energy, we think, well, the sun. We think of, you know, lighting a match, something like that. But also fire can express itself as chili. When you eat chili, there's a fire energy there. Or when you eat sunflower seeds, that's actually, that actually creates a fire energy in your body, increases fire in your body after you consume it. Oranges are fire. 
So they have an alchemical reaction of the body, which is increasing fire. So fire, you know, and then you have like, for example, when you get a great idea, the neurons in the brain are firing. There's another expression of fire. So fire and all of the energies express themselves in various ways, in food, in activities, in personality types, and so on. But So everything we experience in this mundane world is, is, is essentially just a question of those eight energies. But above that is a spiritual energy, the soul, is transcendental. And that's the conscious, that is the, the spark that, that animates the bodies. Without this presence of the soul, the body is just, you know, it's just dead. When we go to a funeral and we see, you know, someone died and, and we have the wake and everything and we look at the body, and it's very common for people to say, oh my God, he's gone, you know, he's gone, we're going to miss him. But actually, the body's right there in front of you. So who's gone? So obviously there's a difference between that person that we knew and the physical body. Even if you're, for example, you may be attracted to some beautiful woman or some beautiful man, if they died and the soul was present in the body, you would not be attracted to that body anymore. So what makes the body attractive is the presence of the soul. That's the divinity. That's the, that's the source of divine beauty. So the soul, the, the spiritual energy, the, the purest source that we are, which is personified too, by the way. It's not like we're just a ball of energy. We are, we have a spiritual personality. And that at this time is identifying, misidentifying with the physical body. So we identify with this body. We think we're black, Asian, you know, this or that, all these material designations, which are temporary. And that's what keeps us um, trapped in this material energy, because we're identifying with this mundane energy, thinking that that's us. This is our home, but it's not. So in food yoga is a path, what I teach in food yoga, and what we're trying to communicate through Food for Life Global, is that we all have a, a spiritual divinity, which is transcendental to this material world. And food is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful ways to unlock that awareness. And so that's why, you know, I, I say that evolution of consciousness, spiritual life begins when you master the tongue. Anything orange or red in color creates fire. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's another example. Like colors, certain colors have a fire energy attached to them. So they, you know, they'll when you look at a certain color, they take in a certain color that will actually increase, have an impact on the fire energy within your body. Yeah. So these energies express themselves in different ways. Any other questions? The fat vegan life. <laughs> you guys have got some funny names. Hi, Tony Vegan. How you doing? Are there any books, documentaries that inspired you the way of thinking? Well, um, there's quite a few. Um, but as I said, my roots are that I studied the ancient Indian texts. And so that became the, like the foundation of my, my spiritual quest. But over the years, I've, you know, I'm very eclectic and and I'm very open-minded, so I've studied other, even Wiccan actually. I've looked at Wiccan, you know, the Wiccan path, and I've I've got I've learned some things from that. So um, every tradition, spiritual tradition, is something of value to offer. Um, but when it all gets down to it, you know, there's there's a, just a couple of central truths that we're we're eternal, we're spiritual by nature, and this material world is simply a place to, you know, to be educated, a place for experiencing. Uh, it's not a place where we're meant to stay. We're meant to basically improve ourselves here. Um, you eclectic? Yeah, I am very eclectic. <laughs> it's, you know, you, I haven't even, I mean, a couple of years, when was it? Nine, two, ten years ago, I actually invent, invented a billiards aiming product. So I'm actually an inventor too. <laughs> I invented this billiards aim tool, which was based on ge geometry, and uh, you know I sold it in the marketplace. So it's good. So I'm a, also a, a, I teach billiards. I'm, I'm a good billiards player. So yes, I'm very eclectic. eclectic. So.
So um, thank you very much. Everyone that has already donated, as the previous streamers have talked about, um, Food for Life is very efficient and we can feed a lot of kids for very little money. Um, and the reason why we're efficient, like for example, our biggest programs are in India. And by the way, many of you may not be aware, but India actually has the greatest uh, amount of malnourished children in the world. So, you know, there's, there's this sort of idea that it's only in Africa, but actually India is, you know, there's a lot of malnourished, I think nine out of 10 pregnant women are also malnourished. It's, it's a big problem. What is the product called? Oh, the billiard aim trainer. However, my website's down right now. You may see it on YouTube, the billiard aim trainer. That. So after the goals are rich, what will be done with the money and and if you get more money, will the money be spent all over the world? Yeah. So I was just going to get to that. Um, so our biggest programs are in India, and where we have very efficient programs. And so all the money that we collect here uh, will be given to our partners in India, where they where they're feeding you know 1.3, 1.4 million children every day. Um, and if we get more, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll give it to other projects around the world. And of course, the the efficiency varies. Like it's obviously more expensive in countries outside of India. And the reason why India is so cheap is because of the scale, and also because the Indian government subsidizes. They actually give us lots of free food and grains and things like that. So that brings our cost down. Our biggest ex our biggest expense in India, at the, the projects in India, are like security, transportation, and things like that, and operations. But I think all the food is donated, which really brings our cost down. And that's how we can feed, you know, a kid $10. We can feed a kid for a month, no problem. Um, thanks for guesting. That was so much fun. Okay. It would be nice to do that in the USA to do just kids about the homeless. Do yeah. We do have projects in the USA. They're, they're very small, but we do have projects in the USA. Um, I actually have, if you go to the Food for Life website, on the home page there's a map. And the map is, it's a Google map, and it gives you a list of all of the projects where you can actually contact them, uh, you know, the contact person, phone number and so on, and you can, you can volunteer if you're interested to help out. So there's a Food for Life map on the home page. So check that out if you want. Um, to feed the whole world, yep. <laughs> yeah, we want to feed the whole world. There should be in a, in 2016. There should be no hungry people. It's crazy. And the only reason I, why there is hungry people is because of inequitable distribution. The food is not being shared equally, and that is because of inequality. So the root cause of everything is inequality, spiritual inequality. So that's what we're trying to teach the food yoga and food flow global. Yeah, selfish, exactly. Yeah, where is Joe Vegan? Um, does anyone else have any questions? Anyone want to guest? So while I've got you there, you guys, um, I'm going to give you a quick view of our sanctuary at the back. It's the backyard. You see a big bull there? That's Balaram. Balaram and Gita, the white and brown one at the back, that's a cow, and Balaram is a big bull. He's like 1,500 pounds, but he's a big pussycat. He's really gentle. And um, he was rescued from birth. So what happened was my wife had the sanctuary in another location, and it was next to a dairy farm and one one morning she heard you know the cows she heard Gita the one at the back there screaming and the dogs barking and she wondered what's going on and she raced raced outside went went down to the paddock and she saw this mother cow from the next door that had jumped the fence and gave birth to this little boy on her property so it's like the mother knew that Juliana's sanctuary was a safe haven for her son. And if she didn't do this, her son would be killed. 
field, which is what happens to real real calf. So Juliana was like, and then the, then the, the, the farmer came over and says, oh, you know, that's my cow. I'm taking him back. And then Juliana says, no, no, no. I'll, she, she had the baby on my property. I want the baby. And so I think she gave the guy like 50 bucks or something like that. And he let her keep uh, the bull, who's now known as Balaram. And they're beautiful little bull. So she, she bottle fed him. She literally is his mother because he didn't get to drink from his real mother. He's a beautiful bull. And we have two other bulls too, just new ones we rescued recently. And they're both, they're all so sweet. And if I could, I'd take you around. But I don't know if the internet would last, <laughs> if the connection would stay good. Yeah, you can read the stories on um, the website. Yeah, my wife, like, Kishan personified. She's so, so loving to animals. She's an angel for them. It's amazing. That's her website. If you want to check it out. So the sanctuary is the only, it's the only animal sanctuary in Colombia. And it was the first one ever established in South America 10 years ago. And so she's been, you know, doing it for 10 years. We just moved to a new property. And uh, we're also doing a fundraiser for the sanctuary to raise funds for the completion of the project. And the new direction for this sanctuary is that we're going to we're going to actually include a food yoga academy, so people can come. We have guest, guest rooms, so people can come and actually get food yoga certified. And I will teach vegan nutrition and the spiritual side of food, you know, food yoga, uh, veganism, and so they can get certified here. We have a food yoga food yoga academy offline and also online. So that's like a new thing we're doing. Awake again, you delicious. Good morning. <laughs> Hugs and good morning. Yeah. Thanks, you delicious. So we have you can hear the stories of all of the amazing schools that she's done um, over the years on her, you know, website. On your site, that's so interesting. Yep. Food yoga is, you know, it's, it's something that I created about five years, four years ago or something like that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been so busy with the sanctuary, so it's sort of been going along slowly. But I have done workshops all over the world, in Australia, in Taiwan, in China, in Hong Kong, in America, in the UK, in um, Colombia, obviously, here. Um, where else? I think that's all. And I definitely want to do more like food yoga workshops in different parts. But we have an academy. We're going to set up an academy here. And so I honestly, you're going to love it. If you any of you guys want to come and visit the sanctuary and stay here, we have guest rooms. Um, and you can check out the animals and then also be food yoga certified. I highly recommend it. You'll definitely love it. Wow, thanks. I'm very vegan for inviting so many fans. Um, Thanks, you buying <laughs> buy my book. Spread the word too. And also in the in the back of Food for Food Yoga, there's a whole section on Food for Life Global. Because as I said, it's like the philosophy of Food for Life Global. So I get into the nitty-gritty of how to be a food yogi, beginning with becoming more conscious of nature, more conscious of your food choices, understanding energies and stuff like that. Um, and then at the end I explain, you know, about Food for Life Global, the work we do. Yes, please take me up on that. I would love you guys to come. Thanks, Mr. Joy, for posting the donate page. Yeah, please donate if you can. Um, we have some great perks too, like $10 will feed a kid for a month. But if you're up for it, if you donate $108, not only will you feed a kid for a year, but you'll actually get gold. So we have these cards. They're like credit cards. They're hard plastic credit cards, right? And there's gold, a gold ingot embedded in the card. So you can, like you have real gold, 24 karat gold. Uh, so for $108 you get gold, plus you can feed a kid for a year. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbeatable. If anyone has any other questions? If anyone wants to guess? 
if you want to know about what it's like to be uh, a monk, <laughs> or if you want me to tell you some war stories, some food for life stories on, on, on you know, out in the field, I have some amazing stories. Um, maybe that's a good one. I, I can tell you one story that uh, back in uh, 1994, when I was traveling as a monk, I was traveling through Russia, the former Soviet, and um, there was a civil war going on between Abkhazia, Abkhazia and Georgia, which is the southern part of Russia, right? Um, and so I, I said, you know, and I was very naive and sort of enthusiastic. I says, hey, I'd like to go, you know, go check that out because we actually had people there feeding. We had a team of volunteers feeding people during the war. It was a civil war. It was big. It was like serious because the, the Georgians actually had the backing of Russia. So it was like it was a serious battle. Film. We also did Food for Life in Chechnya too. You're probably more familiar with Chechnya. So anyway, so this particular one, um, I said, yeah, I'd like to go. So then somehow or other, we, you know, we took a train, we took a plane, and we, we got in through, um, we got through the borders, and then we were immediately taken to a, an abandoned restaurant where some deers were feeding people uh, vegetable stew. And one of the volunteers who was feeding the old people, it was mostly elderly people who was feeding because all the, all the young men were at war, and uh, so it was mostly old people that were there. So he was feeding him. He was holding on to incense with one hand. And I said to him, you know, I said to my translator, what's going on? Why is he holding the incense? And he says, because these people haven't had a bath in like a month. You know, so then he's feeding him kitri. And this was going on for about half an hour. And all of a sudden, there's a huge explosion. Like it rattled the building. And we raced outside. And apparently, a Russian missile had landed in a paint factory, literally, no exaggeration, like a uh, hundred meters from where we were, like very close. So it shook the building. And of course it's a paint factory, so it just went up in flames. It was crazy. And I thought, oh my God, this is when it hit home. I'm really in a war zone. <laughs> this is serious. So then we, we went back to the ashram where the, the monks, the volunteer monks were feeding, you know, were basing their food relief program from. And um, I remember that night I was sleeping in a sleeping bag and I was hearing planes fly over and machine guns and I thought, oh my God, this is really serious. And of course, all of the roads were blocked. All the shops were empty. There was no food in the whole place. It was just uh, our food relief was the only operation in that particular, at that particular time that was providing a meal, free meal to, to, the, to these people. And that part of the country um, was like, is like the Florida of Russia. Georgia is like the Florida of Russia. So it's like where all the fruits and vegetables traditionally grow. There's a very high, high produce, you know, state, our country. And um, it was a state back then. Um, and so all these people were very rich. Well, they were rich. Now they found themselves to be impoverished. They're like totally, you know, they lost their house. They've got nothing. So then we went to another food distribution point, and I remember we went on the back of this tractor. So one of the volunteers managed to get a tractor that was like the vehicle that they used to get on the town, and they had a trailer on the back. That's where they would carry all the plastic tubs of vegetable stew, right? And so we would we would sit on the back of a trailer, and then he was driving through the streets. And I remember driving through the streets, and then bullets were flying over our head while we we're on our way to this uh, checkpoint you know, to feed people. So we arrived at this place and there's no one around. I'm thinking, where is everybody? And this lady come, comes out of the building and she had like a bandana on, right? She had like a weathered face, a bandana, and she had a whistle around her neck. And she looked at us and she gave us a thumbs up and then she whistled. And when she whistled, all of the people suddenly come from the basement out to greet us, like about 200 people, and led by the children. So the children surrounded us and we had like, one of the volunteers had like cookies and gave all the kids, you know, cookies and everything. So then they took it, they, they helped us with the containers. They took us downstairs where we, we started distributing the meals to the people. And I remember one lady, elderly lady, she had a little girl in her hand and she looked at me and she was, obviously this was translated, 
But she said, she said to me, how is this possible that in the middle of war, you, got, you, you boys are feeding us? And this is amazing. I mean, you must be sent by God. That was her realization. She said, this is a miracle because there was nothing in the city to eat. We were the only source of food. So it was really touching. Um, it was really touching to have that experience. And of course, I was there for, and then I was there for like two weeks and every day going out distributing food. And then after like two weeks, I thought, you know, I've got to get out of here. I've got other places I need to go. But I couldn't get out <laughs> because all the roads were blocked and now there was like a ban. There was no flights, nothing. So I was trying everything to get out and I couldn't. And eventually we thought, well, we have to go to the, the highest authority in the country. So we went to the general of the army. So it was arranged that I had a meeting with the general of the Georgian army, right? So um, I go along with the translator and we go through all the checkpoints, all the security checks. And we go into this room, this big office. This guy's got like three phones. He's a big, big burly guy. He's got all the stars on his, on his shirt. And I explained to him, look, I'm humanitarian. I'm from Australia. <laughs> I need to go. I need to get out of here. Can you help us out? And he says, well, I don't know. There's no planes. I don't know how I can help you get out. And he says, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. When we had a conversation, I'll tell you what I'll do, look. And he wrote a note on a piece of paper. And then he stamped it with his general stamp. And he says, give this to the major at the airport. You know, maybe the, maybe the major can get you out. And I thought, great, yes, I get the general's approval. I can get out. And so at that point, I thought, you know, I want to give him something. So I actually had this, because I, I would do meditation right on beads, on rosary beads. And I had this like little badge of a picture of, god in the indian sense and i thought i want to give you something as protection so i gave him this badge and i stuck it on his chest you know like a like a it's called jagannath it's like an ancient face of god from india and then so we went on our way to the airport we arrived at the airport and then there was um um you know there's we, we Go to the office with we were told okay the majors you know in that that office there we went through this you know a few corridors and we got to this dark room and it was like a hollywood scene seriously it was like very dark smoky there were soldiers playing poker and then this then the, the major is at the back of the room you know, at a desk and he's got a scar running down from one eye down to his you know cheek where he you know from fighting and i said to him look i just met with the general and I've got this piece of paper and I showed him the piece of paper. I think I still have that piece of paper with the stamp on it. And he says, okay, this looks good, but I can't guarantee anything, you know, translation. And then I thought, oh my God, this is really disappointing. So we, we would ask to leave. So we basically had to go outside. And then while we were waiting, because we were just hoping that something would happen, a plane would come in and we could jump on the plane. So during this time, I thought, well, I may as well talk to the soldiers, maybe give them some spiritual insight, you know, because I was a monk, so that's what I did. So I met a couple of the soldiers and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm from Australia, but actually I'm not Australian, you're not Russian, we're, we're, we're spiritual brothers, and, you know, that sort of conversation. And they really liked it. They really liked it. I was giving them some, you know, basic things like that. And I gave him a book, a Bhagavad Gita, I think. And he said, oh, thank you very much, you know, I really need this. And you can imagine in times of war, any sort of spiritual, you know, encouragement, nourishment is really welcomed by soldiers because it's such a tough, tough job. So anyway, so we were outside waiting for like two or three hours and all of a sudden a plane come in. So we rushed down the, down the tarmac, uh, you know, about 500 meters or something. And we saw a, gr a whole crowd of people surrounding this plane. And, uh, and it was like maybe 200 people. At least a hundred people, a hundred people surrounding the plane. It was a small plane, and uh, they were um, they were taking they were taking dead bodies on, and you know women were screaming their heads off and crying. You know, seeing their sons uh, that had been killed, and it was just complete pandemonium. Everyone was screaming. Everyone, everyone wanted to get on the plane, and I thought we've got no hope. We're at the back of the crowd, right? We have no hope to get on. Um, and it got to the point where it was so crazy the soldier at the top of the stairs of the plane, he got the machine gun and he fired it in the air. <laughs> shut up. You know, I just want everyone to shut up. It was just crazy. Everyone was so freaked out, just wanted to get on the plane and get out of there, right? And then all of a sudden, one of the soldiers that we had talked to previously, the one we gave a you know book to, he saw us and he says, Oh, Aussie, 
And then he pushed himself down the steps, down the, the stairs, and he grabbed my translator by the backpack, and then he dragged him on, and I, I held on to my translator, and he dragged us both on the plane. <laughs> it was crazy, and we got on, and eventually, you know, most people, you know, a whole bunch of people got on the plane, some people missed out, but the plane was packed. It was like every seat was taken. There were like 40 people standing in the aisle, and uh, you know, then we, we we took off, and I thought, wow, what a miracle that we got out of this place. You know, so that's that's some of the war stories. <laughs> I have many like that. I kept a diary during that time too. One day I'm going to release a book just on those war stories because I actually kept a diary, and I have all those stories. I have some amazing stories like that. You know, miracles would happen. So. Uh, Anyone have any questions? Too delicious. Thank you. <laughs> Charity for life. That sounds good. I've dedicated most of my to this project since I was 19. I'm now 53. So that's 34 years I've been working in this project. I have many stories. <laughs> There's another story. I'll tell you another war story. Um, that's a good one. Uh, when we were in Chechnya, uh, in Chechnya was, I think, more well known in the West because it was, it was again, Russia against the Chechens. And the Chechens and Muslims, like, you know, Christians versus Muslims sort of thing. Um, but the Chechens are really, really great warriors. They're like amazing warriors and they outsmarted Russia and actually defeated them. It's incredible. Anyway, so we were there. We were the only food relief organization in the whole city. And Chechnya is not a big, you know, not a big um, uh, country, but we were in the city of Grozny, which is the capital. And we were literally the only organization feeding people in that city. Um, and we took over an abandoned school. So it was like an abandoned ki kindergarten. And it just so happened to be next to the Russian, Russian um, military base. So it's certain, it wasn't when I was there, but I heard from the volunteers that there were, there were situations where sometimes fighting was going on in the courtyard. Like there were bullets flying over the building and the volunteers were actually on the floor of the kitchen, hoping that they're not gonna get shot, you know? And actually the soldiers from both sides were very respectful to the volunteers and they, they knew that they were neutral. Um, and they made sure that you know they they didn't they didn't kill anyone, um, and in fact one time they had this uh, ambulance, which they it was like an old ambulance they converted into a distribution vehicle for the meals right, and so uh, one time someone stole the ambulance and the whole city it was even on the news, uh, they posted it on the you know, national television like late, the six o'clock news for out for this van, <laughs> and they found them the next day. Yeah, that's the sort of support they had there. It was like, who the, who the heck would steal a vet that, you know, that's feeding people? Anyway, so that, that happened. So one time I was, I was there for a couple of weeks. Um, and I, I specifically went there to meet with the president. And at that particular time, the president was a Russian, um, you know, a Russian ally. You know, Chechnya had been control, was controlled, at this particular time was controlled by Russia. Eventually, they, the Chechens kicked them out. They outsmarted them. That's another story. But the Russian had appointed, you know, a, a Chechen ally to be the president. So I had to meet with him specifically to get him to agree to give us more money to continue our program. So we set up a meeting and, um, the, you know, we told, told the president what we're doing and everything. And then during this time when we're talking, uh, the general of the army came in and you know, saluted us, how are you doing and everything. And then he had to do something in the office and then he left. Um, but you know, so the, the Chechen president, he says, so what can I do for you? And I says, well, we're feeding all these people. And in order to continue doing this program, we need another $60,000 for the next year. Now, keep in mind, this is 1995. That's a hell of a lot of money, $60,000 in Chechnya. And he says, okay, no problem. He just agreed immediately. I just looked him in the eye and says, you know, we need $60,000. He says, okay, no problem. And he wrote a note. He says, give that to my secretary. She'll give you the cash. <laughs> oh, that was cool. So then we had the meeting with him. 
And then after the meeting, we went to media, uh, you know, the local news channel, and they did an interview with me, Chechen, you know, television. So it was interesting for, you know, an Australian guy in Chechnya, what the heck are you doing here? So they were very intrigued by me. And so I did an interview. And then after the interview, all of a sudden, there was, um, you know, the Russian soldiers stormed into the media uh, house and told everyone to get out, you know, like there was some urgency had just happened. And we later found out that the general who, who, who had visited us uh, during the interview with the president, uh, he, was, he was blown up in a convoy. On his, you know, on his way out after leaving the office, he was in a convoy, and they, they, the Chechens had put a bomb under the a bridge and blew. So that's the nature of war: is that, you know, one minute you're alive, one minute you're dead. It's like crazy. So um, another time, we we decided to celebrate Veterans Day, so we made this huge cake, like a, literally a ton of cake, like a big, you know, God bless all the veterans. It was like the size of it was something like um, six foot by four foot, six feet by four foot, like really, and really thick, <laughs> right? And of course, so we, we brought this cake to the, you know, the, the, uh, the army base. And of course, they're suspicious, so they actually had to stick, stick bayonets in there to make sure there was no bombs inside the cake. <laughs> but they enjoyed the cake. Um, any questions on this? How long have you been a vegan? I've been a vegetarian since I was 16, and I've been a vegan for about 16 since 2000. Um, have you been a vegan? What was the point you, really, you realized it was the right choice? Well, you know, I was a vegetarian for a long time, and I would go to the animal rights conferences in America and vegetarian conferences. And the, veg the vegans there, were, you know, were, were making me aware of the connection between, you know, dairy abuse. And of course, I grew up on a farm. I mean, I, as a monk, I was living on a farm with cows. We would milk the cows. And so we had this intimate relationship with cows. It was very different from what you would experience, you know, in the West. So... Um, you know, I had this respect for cows, but I was unaware of the abuse of commercial dairy cows. And so then after looking at that and listening to, you know, the presentations and doing my own research, I realized I can't, you know, consume commercial dairy and be consistent with my beliefs. So then I went vegan. And I instituted that all food for life programs from now on would be, you know, would be vegan. Uh, so, Judelicious, okay, mate. Uh, what else is there? Reading some of the notes here. You want to answer to me? Uh, let me see. Is here. I know, thanks for the positive comments, guys. I appreciate it. Um, so, we're nearly finished here. I've been raving on. I always thought I would have. Uh, someone else I could talk with, but anyway, I'm glad you appreciated some of the talks. Um, chat the YouTube channel because I've got some documentary. I'm in Colombia, South America, in the Andes Mountains. We're 3,000 feet above sea level, <laughs> very high up. Um, what are you charging for your academy, by the way? We're going to have an online academy, online academy where, you know, first level of food yoga certification will be 197. Um, and then there'll be level two and then master level where you'd actually be certified as a food yogi. Um, so it'll be probably a little bit more than that at the actual physical academy because we're going to be providing a place to stay and everything. Um, but it'll be reasonable. It won't be a crazy price, don't worry. It won't be like, uh, you know, the Living Light Institute or something where it's like really high prices. I'll make it affordable. Um, Colombia is not so hit like a girl. Colombia is pretty far out, honestly. It's it's not like they portray in Hollywood. It's really you know like the Narcos series on Netflix. It's nothing like that because that's all from the nineties. All that stuff is gone. Um, you know all the the drug the drug wars and stuff. It all doesn't doesn't 
you know, happen anymore. You don't see anything like that on the street. You don't even see drug addicts in the street. I mean, it's, you see worse. It is more, it's more dangerous in America, New York. I lived in New York, in the Bronx for two years. And I was, there were, it was more, you know, scary living there than living in Colombia. So yeah, it's not a problem. You should definitely check it out. Come and visit. We have guest rooms here. Um, and you know, it's a very normal price. I think we charge like, the price for the guest rooms. Oh, you don't remember? Oh, okay. 160 is the the small one. Yeah, like 160 for the whole week. You know, we have like, you can just stay or you can, you, know, you can stay with meals and stuff like that. So it's cheaper than Airbnb. Yeah, we should definitely check it out. Hit like a girl. It's worth it, worth a try. I mean, I'm telling you, um, a lot of people are starting to wake up to, you know, Colombia that it's actually a pretty far out place to live. And it's so it's a short trip to Florida. It's literally like you know three hours or something to Florida. So it's a short trip. So you're close to the United States. That's my boy. Hello. Come here. Come up. Just before I go. I'll show you, this is Bimal Fox, and Bimal Fox was born at the sanctuary um, in a water, water pool, like in a, in a pool. His mother gave birth in the pool with, uh, you know, doulas, and uh, he lives with all the animals, he's a vegan, he's a breast milk boy, super healthy, 11 months, uh, and no immunization. <laughs> he's a good boy. He's a little food yogi. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate your support. Please donate, please share. I'll drop in again, you know, throughout the rest of the stream. I'll be dropping in again, um, contributing. He's a singer, he's a singer too. What are you singing? <laughs> okay, bye. Take care. Thanks, I'm very vegan. Yeah, he's very beautiful. He's a good boy. He has his own Facebook page too, by the way. Uh, so <laughs> he's a very unique little boy. Let me see if I can learn here. Uh, so just before I go, this is a Food for Life Facebook page. So like that page, encourage people to like it. Um, this is the Food Yogi page. This one. Thanks. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. Really appreciate it. Love to you all. Bye.